not the sort of person to ever say that I get tired of being right, but at this moment, I, I just about am. When the pandemic began, I publicly expressed concern about the spread of the virus among imprisoned populations and especially among the children held by ICE in cages along the border. I didn't mention nursing homes then, but those in prison and in detention, those housed in long-term care facilities, they have been the hardest hit by the pandemic, accounting for more than half of the fatalities in America. At the end of March, when we first began our lockdown, I posted some meditations online, as did our associate pastor, David Ketchum, and they were particularly aimed at those who have a proclivity for drug abuse, depression, or who suffered from social uh, uh, suicidal ideation out of the fear that all three of those problems would be exacerbated by the social isolation that the pandemic would uh, force on us, and we have seen those concerns come true as well. I did my master's thesis in the treatment of alcoholism. I've been a supporter of AA and Al-Anon meetings for more than 40 years, and I have never seen a holiday or an event of weather that ever canceled a meeting. If uh, meeting day fell on Christmas, some of the new members would always ask, well, are we going to meet on Christmas Day, and the question always was, did you ever drink on Christmas Day? So we always had meetings, snowstorms, ice storms, whatever. The pandemic, however, has been different, and most meetings have gone online, and for an awful lot of folks, the support that they receive from Zoom meetings and social media has just not been the same. So I expected addiction to be a growing problem, but I was not prepared for what I read in the Washington Post a couple of weeks ago when they published that nationally overdoses in the United States jumped 18% in March, 29% in April, 42% in May. We were already having about 60,000 addiction deaths a year. And the thought that, they, that that rate could have gone up by 42% in a single year is just shocking. Our governor has announced that the addiction rate to opioids had gone down in Missouri. Well, it did in 2019. But in the midst of the pandemic, I don't know why he's talking about 2019 numbers. There was a significant, though not huge, decrease in 2019 over 2018, but there is every reason to believe that 2020, the numbers have gone through the roof. Data for June and July are not currently available, but given the meteoric rise in April and May, in spite of a relative silence in the media, deaths from overdoses, primarily from a synthetic form of fentanyl, must be rivaling the fatality rate of COVID-19, literally a silent pandemic within the pandemic. I've invited two of my friends, both of whom I've known for more than 25 years, to join me today. Dr. Paul Tomlinson has two PhDs in psychology and is a leading researcher in suicides, causes, and prevention. We've done a few conferences together on addiction, and uh, because we're going to be time limited today, we've already promised ourselves there'll be a follow-up to today's work. Dr. Steve Christensen is a former trauma surgeon who evolved into being an addiction treatment physician. So each of us are going to do a short presentation, and then we will question each other. And I encourage our internet audience to write in questions or challenges uh, and we don't, the three of us don't all agree on everything, so there'll be some challenges on screen today, but also write to me if you want to ask questions of this panel or make challenges to what we say uh, for our follow-up session. I'm going to speak first briefly as a member of clergy. I have been painfully aware, as Viktor Frankl noted 
75 years ago that addiction, depression, and suicide are primarily caused by social isolation. Not, not just loneliness. I live alone, I work alone, I get lonely sometimes. But that's not the same thing as social isolation. Many people we, we see who do commit suicide or have addiction problems do have family, they do have a work life, they do have associations, but what we find when we scratch the surface is that somehow they did not have the depth of meaningful relationships that give them a reason to go on. Frankel could not have imagined the emergence of the internet or the concomitant social media. I don't know what he would have said about it, but he did chronicle the breakdown of social norms and customs leading into World War II and the whole Nazi movement, and he, of course, was held in a concentration camp himself. All of the things that once held families together, knit friendships, and gave more substantive meaning to people were being threatened at that time, as the pandemic is threatening it in our time. I've always believed that the two most meaningful reasons for a church to exist in this modern and largely post-theistic age is to create meaningful community and to organize well-intended people into opportunities for community service and action. What's the real difference between getting your religious or spiritual content online or getting it within a congregation? Well, the congregation should be a building of community. And that's where, while I have all kinds of theological issues with the Catholic Church, the Mormon Church, the Jehovah's Witnesses, most mainstream Christians for that matter, but what I recognize is that even in the presence of bad theology, good community gives people with serious depression problems or a proclivity for addiction to drugs or alcohol or other things, it gives them a reason to go on. It gives them connection. There's something about community. But another real uh, deterrent to suicide or to addiction is to believe that the world expects something of you. Uh, Frankel was famous for saying that if you have a why to live, that you can live with almost any how. What stands between many of us in times of great challenge, economic distress, uh, unemployment, uh, illness, what stands between us in suicide is often the awareness that we have a child, we have a, a sibling, we have a friend whose lives would be destroyed if we took our own. It is the meaningful connection that helps us to stave off the worst aspects of depression, but also organizing for meaningful service. If you have an active life of helping to provide food for the poor, housing for the homeless, outreach to people that are genuinely in need, that gives your life some meaning. You don't look in the mirror. There was a Russian poet whose name I cannot pronounce who said, every morning, I take a razor in my hand and I look in a mirror and I make a conscious decision whether I'm going to shave or cut my throat. And I think that difference oftentimes comes down to there is someone who expects something of me. There is a reason for me to go on living. But we make that decision, shave or cut your throat. And most of us keep shaving, gentlemen, <laughs> most of us keep shaving because we believe that there is someone that really needs for us to go on. In the midst of the pandemic, we are nearly entirely prevented from in-person community gatherings and a non-compliant community um, makes community service or public demonstration potentially life-threatening. Now, here in Springfield, Missouri, we've recently passed a mask ordinance. Many states have passed mask ordinances. Many communities in the states that haven't have passed them but you still run into a, a lot of non-compliant citizens. I was recently in New York City, which has had the most strict uh, observations about social distancing and masking, and even there in the hotel where I was staying and shopping area around the hotel, I would say a third of the people were still not wearing masks. In that non-compliant kind of context, it becomes very, very difficult to be active in 
the local food pantry or to go to Black Lives Matter demonstrations because you are risking infection. We do what we can to make progressive faith relevant to our viewers online, but I know that the lack of contact is undermining our ability to be effective. So I want to ask you now, uh, Steve and Paul, for your reactions to this sudden escalation of addiction over the past three months. Let me begin by thanking you for asking me to participate. A great deal has changed in our understanding of the use disorders, which is the present idiom for what used to be called abuse or addiction. There's a growing realization that all of these disorders represent self-medication of what is usually an inherited problem with producing brain chemicals. These disorders can broadly be grouped into self-treatment of anxiety with nicotine, alcohol, marijuana, benzos, uh, such as Valium, uh, and barbiturates, or self-treatment of depression, amphetamines, ketamine, peyote. I'm not sure where LSD falls in. It's still experimental. Since these are inherited diseases, they're best treated by restoring the deficient brain chemicals to, do a, better, to a better balance for, uh, by using medicine, exercise, counseling, or other social interventions so that the patient can be the best person that they can be. I believe that the increase in deaths that we are seeing related to overdose uh, are caused by an increased level of stress that we are experiencing due to the COVID-19 pandemic and the social unrest related to the polarization of society. Stress requires increased coping skills, which have already been stretched thin in many of these people who are already self-medicating to cope. Obviously, it doesn't help that fentanyl has arrived and is incredibly potent. Any failure to appropriately mix fentanyl with the uh, inert base uh, leads to an overdose in one patient and an underdose in another. As an aside, overdose from stimulants has been on the rise in the last year or two and is now nearly as large as opioid deaths. I always wonder when I hear overdose deaths, whether we're only talking about opiates or we're talking about opiates, alcohol, stimulants, etc. Um, of interest, in the most recent press release from the Missouri governor's office stating that the opioid death rates have fallen in Missouri, I, I find that very difficult to believe. Uh, it may be a statistical thing, it may be a reporting error due to COVID problems, but I'm not sure that I believe it. And I'm not sure that they're counting anything except opioid deaths. Today, the most accepted effective therapy for opioid use disorder is monitored maintenance therapy, sometimes called MAT, MMT, a variety of things. The success rates for abstinence-based therapies, all comers, are about 10% at the end of a year. What I mean by that is if you go through any program you want that's abstinence-based and they send you out and you, you can be AA, can be anything, at the end of a year, only about 10% of the people who started the program are no longer, are still off street drugs or whatever their substance of abuse was. The success rates for monitored maintenance therapy for opiates, and by that I mean I accept that you're self-medicating, I accept that this is an inherited disorder, I'm going to treat you with the medicine that your body desires and craves, but I'm going to do it by prescription so you're not buying it on the street. I'm going to do it in a way that's closely monitored and I'm going to try to keep you safe. The success rate of that program coupled with counseling is 70% at the end of a year. 10% abstinence, 70% monitored maintenance therapy. You don't have to be real bright to go. It's better to do that. The problem with monitored maintenance therapy is that we've got a, a, a program that is fairly successful for opiates, 
But nobody's talking about that for amphetamines, though they should be. Alcohol's a problem. We, we, those people can't stop, so you can't give them just a small amount. They can buy it legally. And then we've got the, the benzodiazepines like Valium and things. We need to extend this concept to other places, and we need new drugs, obviously. At any rate, there's a documented reduction in mortality in opiate users if you give them monitored maintenance therapy. An IV drug user, meaning opiate drug user, is about 13 times more likely to die uh, than the average person in a given year. You can reduce that risk to about 1.7 times more likely to die if you switch them to monitored maintenance therapy. An oral opiate user, they don't all inject heroin, is four times more likely to die if he's using street drugs and 1.6 times more likely to die if he's on monitored maintenance therapy, which again means he's buying his drugs from the pharmacy. No problems with fentanyl mixtures. In short, monitored maintenance therapy is safer, cheaper, and it makes you legal. The average price of an oxycodone on the street is about a dollar a milligram. By the way, that hasn't changed for the last 10 years, which should tell you how ineffective the, uh, the legal interdictions are, because if they were making it hard to get, the price would go up. Most oral users use 60 to 120 milligrams a day, so they're spending 60 to $150 a day on their habit. It costs you about $150 to see me once a month, and you can go buy your monitored maintenance therapy for maybe 60 to $90 a month. Big difference. When you do this, it opens a huge opportunity for these people. Because it's illegal and immoral and looked down on, these people can't participate in the economy. They can't pass a screening drug test to start a job. They end up working little bits here, little bits there for cash. When you make them legal, because you can pass the drug test if you got a prescription for what you're taking, you can now apply for better jobs. If your brain is working better because you're not waking up craving and wondering where you're going to score, you can get up and go to work. It is an amazing thing to watch people that basically you thought had no chance six months later find a job, six months after that be in the job, six months after that be talking to you like a normal person who's coming in for a prescription for insulin. It's pretty neat. At any rate, the only other replacement therapies are available are for nicotine. And we all know, because we know somebody who smokes, that nicotine replacement therapy isn't terribly effective. Uh, that's a whole other story, but the ugly truth is we don't have good medical treatment for anxiety disorders. Nicotine, Valium, barbiturates, marijuana are what people use to deal with their anxiety. Our psychologist friend tell us that cognitive behavior therapy is good treatment. I agree, it's just hardly ever available or hardly ever paid for, which is the same thing. We have the drugs I mentioned, which all are habituating. We have gabapentin, which is marginally effective. Uh, and the worst insult at all is when you go to the doctor, tell them you're, you're anxious, and they give you a prescription for a potent antihistamine, which does nothing for your anxiety, but makes you sleepy. Visteril is the favorite one by most doctors. Most of them don't realize it's an antihistamine. We do have the drugs like Prozac, Lexapro, the SSRIs, and we have the SNRIs like Effexor and Cymbalta, 
These drugs in some people do decrease anxiety to some extent. Alcohol is a great drug for anxiety. That's why we all want to drink when we're a kid. We calm down, loosens our inhibitions. It's good in low doses, small amount. When you do it every day, you get into a vicious circle that leads to depression and rebound and alcoholism. At any rate, I wish that there was higher availability of counseling services and that they were much better coordinated with the services I can provide. In my experience, finding a good counselor is difficult, and once found, getting insurance to pay for them is difficult, and then having them move on you is common. Counseling is an investment in oneself and requires time to be effective. For these reasons, my schedule is unfortunately always too full of people struggling with anxiety and depression or fatigue or wanting relief from chronic pain. Thank you. Well, thanks uh, for, for the invitation, Roger. Always a pleasure, uh, of course, to be with you and with Steve today and to share the panel, which I'm looking forward to very much. As you know, I've also been very concerned about the jump that you described um, in overdose deaths, and I've done a couple of podcast pieces on this whole issue uh, for my organization, which is Compass Health Network, which works really hard to, to overcome the problem that Steve's describing about integrating uh, psychotherapy with, uh, with medical treatment. Um, a long way to go in that regard. He's absolutely right about that. So Dr. Nora Volkov, who is the director of NIH's NIDA, National Institute on Drug Abuse, has recently written in the Annals of uh, Internal Medicine how the global COVID-19 pandemic is colliding with the more familiar public health problem of uh, substance use disorders, which we've heard. By that, of course, she meant that we were already in the wildfire of the opioid epidemic and uh, the fatalities related to that when the, the tsunami of, of COVID-19 hit us. Dr. Volkov points out that we can easily see how COVID-19 can make things more difficult for those with addictions. Just look around. For example, the healthcare system may not be prepared uh, to, take, uh, to take care of them in the, in the midst of the demands of the, of the COVID crisis in particular. There's also stigma, shame, social issues created by, the, by this crisis, and so-called so social distancing, which we're all sick of hearing that phrase probably by now, may make folks even more vulnerable because it interferes with many of the basic support systems that are essential to helping them reach and, and retain and maintain recovery. Add to that the fact that the drugs themselves negatively impact our physiology and make us more susceptible to infection and more prone to poor outcomes generally, medically and psychologically. And it becomes very obvious why, why Rogers put this together, the collision of public health crises, the pandemic within the pandemic. As I've noted before, here and other, uh, and other places, the lack of a sense of mission, the lack of purpose in life um, has been identified as one of the major factors that make folks more vulnerable to taking drugs. As Steve mentioned, self-medication. Um, many times that's exactly, uh, precisely what it is, of course. We know that feeling irrelevant, feeling that no one cares about you, uh, feeling disconnected, is probably one of the most devastating feelings that a human being can, can ever have. And we know another epidemic, by the way, that I've talked about here and other places is the loneliness epidemic that uh, is clearly, has clearly been in place. Talk about the perfect storm. Uh, you know, now we're, we're forced to be isolated and, and distant from other people physically and in many cases psychologically. Epidemiological studies show social isolation and neglect increases dramatically the risk of taking drugs, as, and we're not surprised to hear that. And if you're trying to stop taking drugs, it increases the risk of relapse. So, so as Dr. Volkov points out, the challenge is, as she says, quote, how do we provide social support for people at risk of substance abuse during the COVID-19 pandemic? Unquote. Big question. And this got me thinking about what we've learned about substance use in the, in the past few decades. And Steve mentioned uh, medication-assisted treatment. We're going to talk some more about that in the panel, I'm sure. 
Um, and that's one of the big, big movements. But we've learned a lot of other things as well. Some of you may remember, those of, us, those of you of a certain age, a series of anti-drug messages from the 1980s, including one PSA, based on studies from the 1960s, actually, showing rats dying in a cage from heroin consumption, right? You see, in those studies, scientists put rats in cages with two water bottles. One bottle had pure water. The other bottle, bottle had water laced with either cocaine or heroin. In virtually every case, in the free choice situation, the rats would keep going back to the drug-laced water and die fairly quickly of an overdose, almost universally. The conclusions are clear, right? Right? Drugs have an inherent hook in them. They're addictive, and if you start them, they will kill you. That's the inevitable progression. Well, kind of ironically, those messages and the underlying studies became the inspiration for a psychology researcher named Dr. Bruce Alexander at Simon Fraser University. Now, this clever psychologist wondered, what else is going on here? As any good thinking, critically thinking person would, what else might be going on here? And even a, a quick glance should tell us that there's probably something more going on there and, and deserves a deeper look. Maybe it's not just the drugs themselves that explain what's happening. He wondered if it might be the cage that is, literally and metaphorically, the environment in which the rats were placed. And we, human, uh, we humans have uh, some analogs to that that I'll talk about. You know, living as a rat in a cage, pretty bleak, solitary existence, right? I mean, some of us can imagine it now, perhaps better than we could just a few months ago. Pretty bleak and solitary existence, in which there's, in this case, there was really only one thing to do. Take drugs or drink water. So Alexander repeated the experiments, but rather than putting the rats in a small cage, he created what now has famously become called Rat Park. The cage was filled with lots of good things to eat, other rats for socialization, plenty of physical intimacy, rat sex, and toys and colored balls for, in, in, for recreation and distraction, etc. It was a pretty cool pad for a rat. Rat Park also had two bottles, same as the original studies. Water and one laced with heroin. The rats tried both, and given the choice between good food, enjoyable activities, playful friends, etc., none of the rats became addicted or overdosed. Not a single death by overdose. They, in fact, didn't even like the drugged water. Now, you know, you might question whether or not that really, it's rats in a cage, right? That has no relevance for human beings. Well, I would argue that it does, and, and significantly so. The relevance, of course, and pesky research ethics prevent us from putting humans in cages for extended period of time to, to do these kinds of studies, right? I mean, as much as we would like to and, and select the participants ourselves, we really can't do that. It won't, we can't get it past the IRB um, as much as I've tried. But uh, as Johan Hari beautifully uh, describes in his book, Chasing the Scream, in the Vietnam War and its aftermath, we actually have sort of a natural experiment in a way, a natural human experiment that kind of illustrates the principles pretty well. At one point, a huge number, upwards of 10% of American soldiers stationed in a miserable jungle where they didn't want to be and where they might lose their lives at any moment, um, hours and hours and days of days of boredom punctuated, punctuated by moments of sheer terror, uh, that kind of existence, and a bunch of them were using heroin. It was feared that when the soldiers came home, we would have hordes of vacant-eyed heroin addicts just roaming the streets like zombies and breaking into our homes to get money for their heroin, and et cetera, et cetera. And that's not what happened, thankfully. When they were removed from their virtual rat cages, so to speak, in the jungles of Vietnam, they were able to come home, often to the embrace of family, meaningful activities, getting reemployed, going to school, using their GI bills, all that. A lot of them were just simply no longer interested in heroin, and they just quit. Right? I mean, it completely flies in the face of this idea that there are these chemical hooks, and once you get that, you're done. Right? They just changed their cages, though. A lot. Significantly. The great Hungarian-born Canadian physician, Dr. Gabor Mate, has put it this way. All substances of abuse will either treat pain or distract from pain. So the question is not why the addiction, but why the pain. Maybe that you fell off of a... Yeah. 
The question is a haunting one. <laughs> Old men on ladders. <laughs> it's our, welcome to our new YouTube series, Old Men on Ladders. This is a, the question is seriously a haunting one. It, it, but it's what we have to answer if we're going to make long-term sustainable recovery really possible for people with addictions, in my view. The sources of pain that humans treat with whiskey and Oxycontin with cocaine and benzodiazepines are many. Chronic physical pain from illnesses and injuries. Steve's going to speak about that more. It's, it's certainly for that. But I'm convinced it's much more likely to include psychic pain, psychological pain, from trauma, either in childhood or later, from interpersonal alienation, from primary relationships, from family disconnection, from conflict, and these days even from political screeching and isolation and a whole lot of reasons why people are in pain. From abject loneliness, as I've mentioned, you know, 13% of people before this all started said zero people in a certain national survey, zero people knew them well. 13% have nobody that they feel knows them well. What kind of life is that? So there are real sources of pain that lead many of us uh, to find connection with alcohol and other drugs. Alcohol is a big one, by the way. 300%, the, the data that I saw, 300% jump in sales of alcohol from January to March. I haven't seen anything after that. So that's, you talk about number one drug in America, it, there's no question what that is. Um, but these sources of pain, again, lead to self-medication, as we've heard. Sources of pain that we must find ways and means of treating. I'll conclude with an all too obvious application of all this to our current circumstances, the crisis of COVID-19. Under quarantine, we may all begin to feel like rats in cages, right? But what if our cage is feeling pretty desolate, like there's only a couple bottles we have to choose from? We might begin to choose the whiskey bottle more often than we, could, than we should, right? 300% increase from January to March alone. We might begin to choose that whiskey bottle, the bottle of pills that's in the medicine cabinet, whatever, the fentanyl that we might easily find on the street these days, rather than the healthier water bottle. If we don't take care to do what? Make sure that our cage is enriched. Make sure that our cage is not a bleak and desolate place. Remember, Rat Park was an enriched environment that included, not insignificantly, other rats with whom to play, socialize, have sex, be close to. So we need to enrich our environments by bringing our offline supports online through regular phone calls, for example. Good old, plain old phone calls, if we remember how to do that. Uh, I'm not sure I do. I remember how to text, and then that's pretty much 95% of my communication. But phone calls where you can hear their voice, timbre of their voice. FaceTime, Zoom, syncing up. There's this app where you can sync up Netflix accounts where you can watch, you know, do virtual movie parties, etc. There are lots and lots of ways to enrich our cages these days. Getting and or staying connected with others is really the most important thing we can do for ourselves right now in my, in my view. We need to enrich our environments by refusing to drink from the fire hose and restricting the flow of bad news and misinformation. There is an absolute onslaught of these days, as you well know. There already was, but it's gotten much worse in the last few months. Make sure we're getting good information. Balance it with stories of human kindness and resilience, of which there are many, many, many. I hate to quote, I don't hate to quote Mr. Rogers. Always look for the helpers, his mama told him. That's good advice. Always look for the helpers. There's a lot of them, a bunch of them in this room right now. We need to enrich our environments also by developing mastery. Learn something new, practice something old. There's lots and lots of good advice out there for how to enrich our cages. Some way of adding beauty to your own life and importantly to the lives of others. Some way of contributing joy to someone who may desperately need your light. That's good medicine for you and for the object of your love and tenderness. So let's all enrich these cages we're living in together. I also want to speak finally specifically to the potential perfect storm as we're talking about suicide in, in, uh, embedded in this possible, uh, um, in this pandemic of uh, overdose deaths, some of which may be intentional suicides, of course. Um, clearly, there are major risk factors afoot for a spike, a major spike in suicide, which we were already worried about. We were already losing about the same number, more than we were losing to car accidents, 45,000 or so um, a year to uh, intentional um, verified suicide. 
but you know we have economic stress, so, uh, stress social isolation, loss of community, religious contacts, uh, barriers to mental health treatment that Steve also mentioned, um, other medical problems that are not getting proper treatment, social media influences, uh, not insignificant in my view. So far, though, we don't know what the impact is on suicide, and, and I, I don't claim to know every source of data, but right now what we're seeing is a lot of projections, but, you know, and I've seen some regional numbers about, you know, increases in from anecdotal stuff from people, you know, more folks showing up at the emergency room, et cetera. But so far, we don't know what the impact is on suicide reliably, in my opinion, um, but we are worried, and with good reason. Um, yet, there's some cause for optimism, and I'm always looking for that on this point. Suicide rates have actually declined in the period after past national disasters, for example, September 11th, terrorist attacks. One hypothesis is the so-called pulling together effect, whereby individuals undergoing a shared experience might, might support one another, thus strengthening social connectedness. Recent advancements in technology, video conferencing, the classic Zoom happy hour, that's what I think of. Might facilitate pulling together. Epidemics and pandemics may also alter one's view of health and morality or mortality, making life more precious, maybe. Right? We keep thinking maybe this will teach us a lesson. Maybe we will listen to the better angels of our nature and begin to see life as exactly what it is, which is a precious thing. Maybe death is more fearsome than we thought because life is so precious. And suicide, thus, less likely if we can begin to see life that way. But clearly, we're not pulling together in a lot of ways, to the extent that we could anyway, or should, in order to make this a real protective factor against suicide. So I'm worried. I'm very worried. Because we have evidence that folks are simply, intentionally in many ways, not pulling together and sowing seeds of division, etc. So wear a mask. Let's conclude with that. It's a tangible sign that you care about somebody other than yourself. And that, maybe, just maybe, we can pull together. I want to lead off by just making the observation that the point of doing this is to provide helpful and useful information. Uh, I've known Steve for over uh, 30 years, well, 29 years now. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, we always tend to go to where we disagree and, uh, and don't get off that point too quickly. But I trust that all of you heard uh, at least one difference that both Paul and I come at this from a counseling vantage point. Steve comes at it from uh, uh, a medical vantage point. And so Steve tends to see addiction as perhaps an inherited proclivity for abuse of substances. Paul and I both think it's much more circumstantial. Wouldn't you say that's fair, the, the Rat Park image? Although I think listeners have to understand that both of those ways of understanding are relevant. And it, it ties into another... Um, not a difference because I think the three of us all agree on it now, but when I was in grad school and we worked on um, alcoholism in particular, the position of AA has been that, uh, and no one should ever speak for the AA movement, but what I garner from the AA movement is that addiction is an illness and that it has to be treated with absolute abstinence. And I've heard many, many alcoholics in meetings say, uh, that if I just had one sip, that it would take me right back where I was at the point of death in my addiction. And, and uh, again, a frequent saying is that one drink is too many and a case is not enough. But what Steve mentioned is that uh, we find a much higher rate of success by going to moderation. Now, in Steve's particular work, uh, that moderation takes the form of medically monitored administration of, of medication. But for those of us in the behavioral sciences, it comes down to helping people to adjust their environment so that moderate drinking is possible for them. And I, I fully expect to hear from a lot of AA folks that that's complete nonsense, that 
uh, only abstinence works uh, in the treatment of addiction. But statistically, what we see is it's much, much less likely to work than an approach of moderation. Is that fair, guys? I think that the treatment of any abuse disorder, doesn't matter whether you're talking about smoking cigarettes, drinking alcohol, using opiates, or using Valium, has about a 10% success rate when you use complete abstinence. I just had never put those numbers together until we were preparing this talk. But if you ask me what the success rate of smoking cessation is, if you go cold turkey, I'm going to tell you it's between 5 and 10%. If you use nicotine patches, it's around 10 to 15%. Uh, you know, it's really the same bit of information. Success yeah. rate with abstinence is 5 to 10%. Yeah. And, and I can confirm in my work with the VA in our addiction treatment program, uh, we define success as six months of sobriety. And uh, with a hospital full of professionals, we had a 7% success rate. Paul and I really became close 25 years ago when we were both working on a uh, methamphetamine addiction research program. And we interviewed, was it 64 recovering addicts? Yep. All of whom referred to us through the penal system. So everyone that we interviewed for that project had been in prison for methamphetamine use and abuse. And what our research told us at that time was that the, the span of time between first use and second use was less than 12 hours. So we, we concluded that everybody that took meth became a meth addict. What I did not know until after we had published the results of that research was that a member of my staff was a weekend meth user. Two of my friends were weekend meth users. We, from the people we talked to, it was unheard of that anyone took meth episodically. But the truth is, an awful lot of people take meth episodically. And in fact, some of the prescription medications given for ADD and things like that, uh, Adderall in particular, is, uh, Paul and I will say is the same thing as methamphetamine, and Steve will say it's close. But uh, <laughs> Close enough for rock and roll. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. take two of them and it's meth. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but, but there are a lot of people that use meth, uh, that are not day-to-day -day addicts. So there's a big difference, and I'm, I'm still going to go for the behaviorist view of that. Yeah, you know, it's, I'm, I'm glad you brought up the meth project, which we called uh, On Thin Ice, Methamphetamine in the Ozarks. Very clever, right? Ice was one of the names for meth. But you know, one, of the thing, one of the research questions we had in that project was about, as I'm just thinking about this full circle now, was, you know, this idea of gateway drugs. You know, what, how do people get to... You know, what's their drug abuse pattern to get to methamphetamine, which is this deep dive, and then you're off, this, off the charts, and, you know, you're seriously addicted, and you lose all your teeth and all that. How do you get there? And, you know, we had these, these hypotheses we were testing about, you know, well, maybe it's marijuana, maybe it's alcohol. You know, and, and the, the cock-your-head conclusion we came to was, honestly, um, there was so much variability in the, in the substances, but the one one gateway was relationships, that it was relationships that got people into methamphetamine, either their family or their friends or whatever. And so again, full circle, it's like, for me, it really confirms what we're talking about, what I was trying to say today, which is even with their drug use, they're trying to connect. They're trying to connect to something other than the drug, honestly. Um, they're trying to connect with other human beings through their drug use. So that fundamental drive and push for human connection is just shot through all of this discussion for me. I would, I would add the failure of the Just Say No campaign of the 1980s presumed that people believed in their own future, that you're being told that, well, this could cause birth defects, this could cause impotence, this could lead to this, could lead to this, could lead to this. When most of the people that are self-medicating, as Steve was talking about, they are in so much pain, they do not believe in or worry about what might happen to them five years from now. What they are aware of in the moment is that they are in tremendous pain and that if something offers a surcease of that pain, whatever the consequences are, hardly matter. 
but again, dovetailing to, to our research in methamphetamine, we went looking, or at least I went looking. I wrote the original grant request. I assumed that it was spreading among people with highly repetitive uh, jobs like working in chicken processing plants and things like that, or people with self-loathing, uh, weight loss or we knew strippers, uh, sex workers oftentimes used it. But what we actually found was almost everyone took it the first time because someone gave it to them in a social setting. It was never one person going next door to say, can I try some of that stuff you make? It, it was in a social setting in which someone wanted to belong, wanted to be a part, and probably had a lot of internal pain that they needed to treat. That was the initial use in every case of the people that we were interviewing at that time. Again, that's not necessarily representative of the whole, but that's who we saw. I think you may be explaining why some people don't want to wear masks. You know, the, the pain is just so right now that I can put up with my risk of getting uh, COVID virus by just breathing okay now, please. Yes, yeah. I, I do believe that social exhaustion is part of the resistance. It's tempting to see them as sociopaths or psychopaths even because sociopaths and psychopaths, uh, part of their, their uh, illness is a lack of cooperation and a lack of concern about implications for others. But I recognize that some of the people I talk to are just exhausted. They, yeah, they, they are indeed, and it's a little bit uh, maybe a field, but since you brought it up, the masking thing, I, th I think it's really interesting. There's a new study that just came out that, not surprisingly, that uh, folks who support President Trump are much less likely to mask up and, and, and are attitudinally opposed to it, et cetera, et cetera. I'm like, what is that in service of? It's in service of connection, to feel belonging. They want to belong to the tribe. That's what it's all about for them in many ways. I mean, and, and that allows people, by the way, you go back to the Solomon Osh studies of the 1950s, the desire to conform to the group that you love and want to be a part of can cause you to intentionally distort your reality, your perceptions even, to misreport your perceptions. Where they, had, You may remember the study where they had the different length lines and when the other po folks in the group said that they were a certain length, they agreed with them because they wanted, and when it was clearly not the case, um, because they wanted to belong. And I see it as in another one of the many factors that cause people to resist masking up, yet we are in the era of the mask and folks can do that. But again, back to connection. Even failing to mask up is, a, is an attempt. It's in many ways a cry to be part of something and to, to be, identify with a tribe. So yeah, I think it's important for us to kind of recognize that as well and not, not view them as being stupid or as sociopaths or whatever. Um, and, and although if we were to do the research project, I'm sure we would find both, <laughs> both stupidity and sociopathy in a certain percentage. Yeah, yes. <laughs> Yes, we would, especially if I was doing the research. <laughs> Steve, I wanted to ask you about the use of, is it, is it Narcan pens? Is that the injection that stops? Narcan? Narcan. Narcan. Yes. Um, why aren't there Narcan injectables in every church office building? Why don't we carry a pen in the glove box of our car if 60 to 90,000 people are going to die of an opioid overdose in the country this year, shouldn't we all be prepared to respond to that? Yes, uh, in theory. Uh, do you have $80 that uh, you want to plunk down at the pharmacy uh, and carry around uh, knowing that it's going to expire in about three to four months because you're carrying it and therefore it's not in a temperature controlled environment? Because if the answer to that is no, you now know the answer to your question. It's expensive, it's short-lived, and I can tell you that it is considered nearly malpractice for me to prescribe high doses of opiates to chronic pain patients or other people, uh, opioid use disorder patients, and not prescribe Narcan. Well, that, that's a good point. I actually had a gay couple that were both heroin addicts in counseling, and between the two of them, they had had three overdose experiences where they called an ambulance, whatever. And I asked them, are you keeping Narcan at the house? And I, I had this kind of stupefied look in response where they said, 
no, the EMS guys have got that. And I'm like, if, if you've already had three overdoses and you know you're still using, why wouldn't you keep a Narcan pen <coughs> we, in the we house? We do what we can. We counsel. We write the prescription and send it to the pharmacy. Now I can check my box off that I've been a good doctor and I've done what I'm supposed to do when the narc police come and check my records. But probably one in 10 people fill it because they go to the pharmacy and it's not covered by your insurance. And it's, you know. That's crazy. 70 to 120 bucks. Then they go, I, I don't have that money. I'm not going to pick it up. They have it to buy the heroin. I think they should have no, it. No, by the time the I'm market. treating them, they're not on heroin. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But I'm talking about my And their my insurance practice, will yeah. pay for the prescription that I write for them most of the time. Okay. Steve, I was wondering if you might, uh, for the audience in particular, um, describe in layman's terms very simply exactly what medication-assisted treatment is. Uh, it's the way I refer to it anyway. Um, in, in the simplest of terms, what, what, what do you do and, and what's, the, what's the medication and how does that fit into the program um, All right. long term? Let me answer broadly, which will get me in trouble, uh, <laughs> but I like that. Uh, and then let me be specific. Broadly, uh, maintenance uh, or medication-assisted treatment is giving somebody the drug of abuse, in this case, uh, a narcotic at a dose that relieves their cravings, that is you're giving them enough to meet their brain's needs, but not so much as they become sedated and stop breathing and die. It's a narrow window. This is not methadone. It could be methadone. Now, what I'm, this is the part that's going to get me into trouble. What I just said is, is just true. But any opiate that you use can be used if you don't care about the law to do that. I mean, you got chronic pain. You mean any can be used abusively? And can be used for monitored uh, maintenance therapy or medication assistance ah, therapy. Ah, okay, okay, okay. It, it's, there's nothing special about the two drugs that are FDA approved, well, all right, there is something special about one of them, but yeah. we've got methadone, which can only be prescribed legally for chronic pain as an outpatient, like in my office, or it can be prescribed legally in an, a methadone treatment center, uh, which I have been uh, the director of in the past, uh, for opioid use disorder. And then we have a second drug called buprenorphine, which is a little bit unique. There is more than one opiate receptor in our body, and most of the opiates that we're familiar with, morphine, methadone, oxycodone, hydrocodone, are pure agonists. They are a key that fits in every lock every receptor that's an opiate receptor in the body, except for nociceptin, and turns it. Buprenorphine, the other drug that we can use for MAT, is a pure mu receptor agonist. It fits in the key, it turns the lock. But it is a kappa receptor antagonist. Now what that means is it fits in the lock, but it doesn't turn the key and it actually blocks the receptor from being hit by another opiate that would turn the key. It's like you put in the wrong key in a lock. Now, that makes buprenorphine inherently slightly safer in terms of respiratory suppression uh, than the pure agonists, and it's why the drug was originally proposed to be used by people in an outpatient setting we, we've come a long way since we passed the laws about methadone treatment centers. But all of these drugs inherently are dangerous. They kill you by suppressing your breathing. And you need to follow people closely. You need to approach the, the correct dose for maintenance very carefully, 
from the bottom side. If you guess too high, you don't get a second guess because they're dead. Yeah. So that, that was a great answer. I just want to put a really fine point on it. So what I heard you say is that at least for methadone and buprenorphine, which are the two biggies, with those are essentially replacement opioids, right? And that's what you're doing is you're replacing the drug of abuse, the opioid of abuse, with a prescription uh, medication that essentially does the same thing but that you, that's slightly safer and that you can manage the dose. So, you know, a lot of people, I think, don't really get that, that, that notion that what we're, what we're really doing is we're, we're replacing the more dangerous opioid with a less dangerous one that we have, uh, uh, you know, a bit, as you say, a narrow window. But there's another... There's another uh, MAT medication I'd like to ask your thoughts about, which is, of course, naltrexone, which is an entirely different uh, approach that, uh, again, people, have, I think, the, in common parlance, I think folks have lumped them all together, and that's a very different uh, approach to medication-assisted treatment, isn't it? It really is, uh, and it's, it's one that uh, in some ways is, is quite interesting. If you look at the data... Uh, which is always a good thing to do before you open your mouth. Uh, <laughs> I, I recommend it, but yeah. you can always follow it. <laughs> the use of, of naltrexone, which is a pure agonist, I'm sorry, pure antagonist, it's a key that fits in the opiate receptor locks and won't turn them. And it blocks all other opiates from getting to the lock, just like, again, a key that is the wrong key for a lock. Which is what methadone does, right? No, methadone is a pure agonist. It fits the lock and turns it. But you don't get high, or your patients don't get high? Uh, well, typically no, high. because of its long half-life, you don't get the big peak. You're only high when you get a rapid rise in opiate levels in okay. your brain. Okay, all right. At any rate, uh, if you look at the success rate of naltrexone, it is nearly as good as using uh, methadone or buprenorphine. Most of those studies have been done by uh, clinics that really didn't want to use agonists, and so they put a lot of effort into doing uh, the best they possibly could with, with this other tool that's new. Time will tell whether that statistic holds up. Right. Again, in my opinion, we're talking about an inherited disorder that makes you susceptible to functioning better in some way when you take an opiate. Right. Does it make sense, if that's the case, to block people's opiate receptors so they can't take an opiate? I really don't think it does, but that's personal opinion. It is yeah. a useful drug, and, and curiously, as you, as when we talked before uh, we, we came on here, I mentioned that 90% uh, of all my chronic pain and opioid use disorder patients either have a family history of alcoholism, narcotic uh, use, or bipolar disease. Uh, I got to write that article sometime. Yeah, you really uh, do. I really do. Uh, but the same drug is useful for alcohol. Absolutely. Uh, treatment. For sure. That's uh, where it got started, I think, wasn't it? It was original use. Yeah, it was yeah. originally there. I mean, when you think about it, alcohol works directly as a facilitator of the gamma aminobutyric acid uh, receptor in the brain, which is the one that makes you calmer. Uh, and why, it, it's not an opiate. It, it doesn't hit opiate receptors directly. Why would a drug that blocks opiate receptors, naltrexone, help people stay sober? Well, there has to be some connection between anxiety and the drugs that regulate it and the numerous things that opiates regulate in our body, pain, mood. I mean, we know that if you go running, if you're still able, uh, and 
you can get a runner's high. Well, that runner's high is from the release of endogenous opiates. endorphins, which is a nice way of saying the opiates that your body normally makes. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, before we run out of time, and I want to pull this down to some practical advice, about 80% of the alcohol consumed anywhere, 80% of the drinks ordered in bars, whatever, are consumed by an alcoholic. In spite of how um, the, the television ads try to make drinking this versus that more sophisticated and socially integrated, the truth is that most bars would close and most distilleries would close if it were not for the purchases made by alcoholics. That this is, this is a drug that is legal and readily available across America and, and available to be abused. We just keep acting like the abusers aren't really abusing, that they, they get drunk every night, but then they get up and go to work the next day. So they are functional, but, but terribly abusing the substance. But at the same time, we have so many people with prescriptions for anxiety stuff. We've got so many amphetamines and opioids. The, the one funeral I've done for a heroin addict followed the, the track that we've talked about a lot. She had back surgery. Then she got uh, uh, oxycodone prescription, got addicted. The doctor got scared, wouldn't give it to her anymore. She turned to street heroin and then overdosed and died. I'm not sure that that's really the most common track. That's the one that people talk about. I think the self-medicating track, like a lot of what we heard in the methamphetamine research, was just people in social parties and what have you passing around what is now fentanyl or heroin. But if, let's say we've got a viewer that's got oxycodone in their house, they may have fentanyl in their house, they may have uh, uh, Adderall in their house uh, from prescription stuff, or alcohol that you can get anywhere, and they realize that they are abusing the substance, how do you get into a medically monitored treatment program or what is the most effective way to get the kind of counsel you need to moderate your alcohol abuse? I'll let you go first. Well, you know, as Steve pointed out, I mean, I, and as a member of the behavioral health and integrated healthcare community uh, professionally for a long time now, I mean, I, I, I beat my chest about it all the time. We, we, we've made real progress in getting access. We've, we, have the, we have a, for example, a compass where what's called the Certified Community Behavioral Health Clinic, which is a wonderful new federal designation for behavioral health. Um, that allows us to be on the same footing as a federally qualified health center for primary care, and et cetera. Um, and what that's done, what that's allowed us to do, really forced us to do, which is where we wanted to go anyway, it's allowed us to do um, much more open access, as we call it. We're able to get folks in to be seen for an assessment same day and, and get connected to treatment uh, within, within, usually within a week. Um, so, um, you know, we're making progress. This, the CCBHC movement, as it's called, um, federal designation, Missouri is one of eight states um, that we're, we're uh, sort of in that demonstration project, and we, we are hopeful that it will continue and that it will continue to be funded, has really improved that very issue. The real issue is it's like, uh, you know, justice delayed is justice denied. Well, treatment's the same with treatment. You know, treatment delayed is treatment denied, and um, it's allowed us to really improve our stable of folks and train people in evidence-based practices, including cognitive behavioral therapy, as Steve mentioned, which is um, one of the best uh, approaches to psychotherapy that we have. Um, so we've made progress, but the, the best, I mean, uh, honestly, it's still the best way to, to get access to treatment is to, um, to visit your community mental health center. Uh, we're still doing the same job we're doing forever, and I think we're doing it better than we ever have, even though it feels like we're trying to sweep off a beach sometimes with the, the amount of demand that we have. Uh, the short answer uh, for how do you find monitored uh, uh, maintenance therapy or medication assisted therapy, which are the same things, uh, is to uh, get on your cell phone, Google buprenorphine therapy in my area, and you'll be almost certainly taken to the federal uh, registry of people who have been certified to write buprenorphine. 
Uh, you can search by zip code, you can search by town, uh, and you'll find somebody within, depends on where you live, but within 100 miles. Uh, there aren't nearly enough. It's not hard to get certified, but my son is a physician, and I can't get him to get certified because he doesn't want that kind of patient as his majority. Uh, I understand what he's saying. On the other hand, sometimes you got to go where the need is. And believe me, there is a huge need. Uh, I have, I practice up near Kansas City three days a week. I have people who come from as far away as Kabul, Rogersville, Springfield, uh, Kansas City, Columbia. I mean, there's a 150-mile radius. Now, most of my patients don't come that far, but it's, it's kind of like a counselor. Once you find somebody that you like and you get along with and you're working with, you're willing to drive once a month you bet. to see them. Well, bless you for doing that work because, and you, you hit the nail on the head, and, and not to bag on your son, but he, those kinds of people, those kinds of patients as your prime, you know, that speaks of a kind of shame and stigma that is really, in many ways, in my view, the fundamental problem. You know, human beings, we all, you know, from the time we're born, we are prone to desirous of changing our consciousness. You know, have you ever seen a kid spin around till they get dizzy? What are they trying to do? They're trying to change their headspace. And, and all medications, all drugs, all experimental and, uh, and recreational, we're doing the same thing usually. We're trying to change our headspace. There's nothing more natural than that in a way. And we really should stop shaming people for that, number one, and for developing disorders or developing problematic substance use. And you think about a natural experiment, another analog. I talked about the natural experiment of Vietnam as the rat cage. Well, there's a natural experiment in Switzerland for medication-assisted treatment, which is, and that's a conservative country, by the way. They didn't do it because, you know, hey, you know, this is, this is okay, you know, we should allow, legalize drugs and allow people to get high, whatever. They did it because there's an, an economic reason for doing it, because it works. They allow people, they have clinics where you can go get not a replacement opioid, you can get medical-grade heroin. And, 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 you know, have it medically administered for as long as you want. And they have some people that have been doing it for a long, long time, and, but many people don't. You know what the difference is? They don't shame people, and they put massive efforts toward supporting them, giving them job training, therapeutic, psychotherapeutic counseling, um, a, a number of social support um, efforts. It's all surround, wrap around, what we would call wraparound services here. It supports them, and, and, and they stop shaming them. And it it's a remarkable turnaround in what's happened. They were a nightmare scenario before they did that. And, and again, I'm not saying, hey, legalize everything, but it's a different discussion. But I'm saying what they did was medication-assisted treatment with the exact same <laughs> you know, drugs that people were actually addicted to. So, uh, but anyway, the fundamental point I was getting at is it's the shame and stigma surrounding substance use disorders and, and pointing our finger at them as those kinds of people. We're all those kinds of people. Yes. Yeah, we are. I could not agree more, really, Paul, that that uh, uh, a lot of what keeps people from getting jobs is they've got a criminal record, and the criminal record is related to a drug charge. And we have criminalized addiction when addiction is something that needs to be treated but not criminalized. And we should get everyone who's in prison for drug-related charges out of prison, and I think we should legalize an awful lot of drugs, at marijuana in particular, uh, because when when uh, what is available to people is fentanyl or methamphetamine, right. they're going to fall a lot harder than they what, fall with other stuff. Exactly. I want us to wrap up, though, and I'm going to do a, a, a fire round here of just ask each of us to make one suggestion to our audience, a, a helpful suggestion. And I'll, I'll start. The one thing I think that churches have to offer uh, and that other groups should offer as well is to try to keep building community. Even in the pandemic, like I don't do counseling inside anymore. I, I will meet with uh, a counseling client outside under our drive under drop off and I have coffee and you socially distance, you keep a mask on and still 
have meaningful contact with people. I think you should make more phone calls, you should use social media, you should learn how to use Zoom, and churches everywhere need to create at least some way that members can get together. Obviously, outside is better than inside, and certainly with social distancing. But I think the longer the pandemic goes on, the more isolated we feel. I know I feel it, that the first month or two, I had enough work writing projects to catch up on that I just didn't even notice. But the third month and now the fourth month, it's wearing on me. And, and I know that I need to maintain social contacts, and I'm sure that everyone else does too. Uh, one suggestion, okay. Be the best person you can be today. And if that means that you need to smoke a cigarette or take a Valium or use an opiate, then that may be what it means. But you have to consider all the consequences, and you got to do it in the safest possible way. So I want to bring it back to suicide. As you know, I'm a big advocate, and uh, I work extremely hard every chance I get to uh, help folks understand the reasons people die by suicide. And as I mentioned, there are a lot of risk factors afoot that have been made worse uh, lately. So my one thing is that if you're thinking about suicide, if you're thinking about dying by suicide, um, don't do that and reach out. There's a number, the National Suicide Prevention Hotline, which is one 800 273 talk that's 8255 by the way interesting within less than two years we're going to have a national suicide prevention number uh, the analog to 911 except it'll be 988 988 and 2022 will be the national uh, suicide prevention uh, you dial that number 988 if you're feeling suicidal right now it's again 800-273-8255 and we know the reason people die by suicide um, it is a, it's never simple, but it, people who die by suicide, this, this part is simple. They don't want to die. They don't want to die. They just want the pain to stop. And there are ways we can help treat the pain. Uh, and so the, the best and most important way is to reach out, get connected. Help is available. Help works. And uh, stay with us. We want you to stay. Thank you, Stephen Paul. Thank you for watching our videos. We are entirely dependent on the donations of our listeners and members. We hope that you find this content to be important enough to help us to keep offering these videos to the public at no charge by becoming a regular contributor. Please click on the donate button on our website at www.spfccc.org. Thank you for your support of progressive religious programming.